Good morning, church, and happy Mother's Day to all that that applies. We celebrate with you. Decided you could be with us across the miles. Remember, this is interactive time, so get out your smart device, chime in, let us know you're here. I want to start by asking you a question, okay? It's going to sound weird. It's a loaded question, but it's profound. All right, you ready? Nod if you're with me. Everybody, okay, all right. If you had just 20 minutes left to live, what would you do? That's a, that's a sobering question, isn't it? If you had 20 minutes left to live, what would you do before you knew you were going to stand before your maker? Before you were going to stand before the way maker? What would you do? Would it change anything about how you live if you could know your expiration date? See, for Cynthia Manley, that was an actual question of what happened with her. She got the alert that she had 20 minutes left to live. And she struggled with what do I do with these last few minutes of my life? So what she decided to do was she got out her pocket device, her little texty texty, and she sent off two messages with her remaining minutes alive. The first one went to her older daughter, Alana, and said this. She was a student at Seattle University. She texted this, stay strong, and no matter what happens, take care of you and your sister. Find a way to get to California and be together soon and be a family. I love you so much, mom. To the other sister, uh, Alyssa, she wrote this, no matter what happens, go finish your degree. Have a great life, be successful, but most of all, be a family. Take care of your sister. So what would you do? What would you say? Who would you text? How would you spend your last 20 minutes? Well, it turned out for Cynthia Manley that she had much more than 20 minutes to live. In fact, her, along with most of the state of Hawaii, ended up having a lot more time. In fact, most of them are still alive today. But maybe you remember, a couple years ago in January, a poor fellow was seated at the control desk sending out alerts when he accidentally hit a drop-down menu and sent this alert by mistake, <laughs> ballistic missile threat inbound to Hawaii. Seek immediate shelter. This is not a drill. Can you imagine the panic and the fear? I mean, I remember seeing photos of parents who were putting their kids down manhole covers, trying to get them in the sewers just to avoid an incoming nuclear blast. Some people panicked and, and didn't know what to do. There was one Catholic Honest theology teacher, he was honest because he shared all three of his thoughts that he had simultaneously. He said, when I first saw the alert, I said, oh no, I haven't gone to confession yet. His second thought was, we have got to get these kids praying the rosary. And his final thought was, where's my whiskey? <laughs> True story. I mean, this is, I appreciate his honesty. For about a half an hour, these people lived in the fear of imminent, uh, imminent doom, genuine nuclear blast coming down on them. And while we can laugh about it now and smile because it didn't happen, it was pretty serious then. But it had a positive ending because it had a side effect that no one predicted. I'm going somewhere with this. You ready? This episode forced people to think about what really matters. Kind of like a pandemic. It forced people to say, what am I doing? What have I done up until this moment? What have I lived for? In light of eternity, do I have anything to present to my king upon my standing in his presence? And this kind of forces us to stop and say, Lord, what really matters? How do we live? What do we need to change in this new era where people are legitimately asking, are these the last days? Because just when you think you have turned a corner, somebody releases the next thing on you, which is murder hornets. I mean... Who thought about this? What is going, are these the plagues? What is happening? And so I was like, murder, can this be real? So I asked my, my crack team, I put Jason and Elliot and Brad and Ryan on it to see if they could find an actual photo of these murder, because I don't believe it, but they, did you have it? Because I hadn't seen it yet. What, what do they got? Did they find one? Oh, come on. For real? <laughs> Striper? And you had to pick the least flattering picture from 1984 for that. That may not be the murder hornets, and we can smile about it now, but I want to ask you a question this morning. As we dive into scriptures, when we're living through a, a pandemic, or maybe you've been just doing some self-evaluation, how are you living in light of eternity? Because the truth is, whether we got 20 minutes, 
20 hours, 20 days, or 20 years or more, if we're not living in the last days, I can tell you this, we're all living in our last days because we don't know when our next breath will be. We don't know when it will stop. That's up to the Lord to determine. But we know this, we will all stand before the Lord and give an account. And you will want to have lived your life well. So that we can hear this beautiful phrase from the Savior. Well done, good and faithful servant. Come and share your master's happiness. Now when we think about living with eternity in mind, this might seem overwhelming. And you think, how do I, how do I change what I'm doing? What do I do? You know, is there anything you can give me, Pastor, to, to live a life that actually matters? So I want to boil it down to just three things, okay? Just three things. Tune out all the clutter and focus in. These are the three things that can affect your time, not only on earth, but will actually carry with you after our time on earth. On that day, the first one is the most obvious, and that is who you have become in Christ. There's nothing more important than that. No one can stand beside you. No one can give you a get-out-of-jail-free card. I mean, this is it. This is you being the Lord. You're standing there. Who you become in Christ. The second thing that carries with you beyond this earth, the glory you bring to Christ. Oh, yeah. Now it's getting real. And the last one, and the one we're going to focus on the most today, is the impact you have on others for Christ. Remember what matters for eternity. Because all these distractions... All the noise, all the stuff we accumulate doesn't make it into heaven. None of it lasts forever. But because you last forever, you get to accumulate rewards. The more you become like Jesus, the more you do to grow. And because his glory endures forever, everything we do to point others to him matters. It lasts forever. And because the people around you are all eternal, made precious in God's image, every time you touch somebody's life, that impact is eternal. And it goes on and on and on like you've thrown a rock into a pond and you see those ripple effects. And you don't even know people you're affecting till that day. Or maybe they come up and they say, you don't know this. But on such and such a date, you said something that made me question. And I went and I researched and I found the Lord through that. So what do we do? And how do we do it? That's what I want to explore with us today. And the time we have together, I want us to focus on the impact we can have on those around us. So that we don't only love God and love people, we actually go out and we serve God and we serve people, living with eternity in mind. So go ahead and open your Bible, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. I'm going to read from the NIV today if you want to sync up with me. The NIV, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Let's start together in verse 10. All right, and it says this. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each of us may receive what is due us for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. Since then, we know what it is to fear the Lord. We try to persuade others. So there it is. There's the deal. What we do with people, hear me, is not what gets us into heaven. It is not about works. But what we do with people will go on forever in heaven. Everyone who trusts in Jesus and his finished work on the cross to provide forgiveness of sin. That is what gives us entrance into heaven. And everyone who goes to heaven will be rewarded according to what we have done on our time together here on earth. So what are we supposed to do? It's those last five words. Look at them. Look at these last five words together. We try to persuade others. There it is, right there. We try to persuade others. That is huge because every person we lead to Jesus will spend eternity with Jesus. We can't even wrap our heads around eternity. It is so vast and so beyond our scope, but it will last forever. So hear me, there is no better use of your time. There's no better use of your treasure and no better use of your talents, all of our lives, than it is to help others come to know him, period. So you know, I gotta ask, how you doing with that? What grade would you give yourself towards living with eternity in mind? I wish I could give you all some magic formula to sharing your faith. There's a lot of great things out there. You know, the Romans Road, uh, Four Spiritual Laws. Y'all remember this? Bill Bright came out with this years ago, and it was beautiful because it, it boiled it down. The, 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 fourth, the first law was God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. If you've lived at all in this recent era, you know that one. And the second one, man is sinful and separated from God. The third one, Jesus Christ is God's only provision for man's sin. And then the last one, we must individually, that means it's on us now, to receive 
Christ's forgiveness and receive him as Lord, allow the Holy Spirit to seal us. Only then can we know and experience God's love, his forgiveness, and his plan for our life. But here's the problem with that. If telling people the four spiritual laws would convert everybody to faith in Christ, then the job would be done. Because these are out there. The problem is, not everybody is in the same spot on their spiritual journey. Some people are like, they're ready to accept the gospel. They've had five, six, seven different touches throughout their life of people planting that seed and it's grown and somebody can come and harvest it. Other people you know full well are diametrically opposed to the gospel. They don't even want to hear it. In fact, they'll work against you. So there's no exact formula, but there is a method. There's something I want to share with you today, okay? You've heard of the four spiritual laws. I'm going to give you four words. Four words that are so powerful, so beautiful. When I first heard them, I think Craig Rochelle was the one who came up with this. And it's so powerful because it works with anyone, no matter where you are on your faith journey. And every one of us can remember four words that change everything. If this works with atheists, agnostics, kind of squishy in the middle, or maybe backsliding people sitting on the back row of their sofa in their little footy pajamas this morning. Maybe it's people who've drifted away. It works no matter where you are in your spiritual journey. All right? So write these down, okay? Here's your four words. They are, I notice and you matter. I notice, okay? I see you. I acknowledge you. And you matter. Not only to God, but you matter to me. See, we may not have the right answer for every question. That's cool. You may not have some awesome earth-shaking testimony that just saves everybody from their sin the moment they hear it. You might have some great theological discussion, but you can notice people, and you can let people know they matter. And here's why this is so beautiful. Because almost everyone responds to being noticed and being considered. Think about it. Almost everybody responds to that. So whether or not they come to salvation right then and there, at least this is a place we can start with anyone. And starting is half the battle. You say, well, pastor, that seems really small. That seems easy. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. It is easy. And it may seem small, but trust me, if this pandemic has taught us anything, it's the little things matter. Right now, people are recalibrating and reevaluating everything. And it's the little things that matter. Remember in Matthew 25, we looked at that verse right at the beginning. It says, well done, good and faithful servant. Come and enter into the, the joy of your master and his happiness. Well, if you go down a little further, Jesus actually sheds more light on that. He gives a better explanation of what this means. Look with me at verse 37. He says this, then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you? Or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in? Or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? Then the king will reply, I see, oh, thank you, buddy. This is perfect. Here we are being given a drink. Truly, I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these, you did it for me. Think about that. Little things matter. And on that day, first off, more than anything you will want is to know where you stood with the Lord. But the next thing you're going to want to be is knowing that you brought others with you that you actually poured your life into somebody, all right? Now, here's the deal. Okay, I'm going to let you in on a secret, okay? And, I, and this, I don't, this doesn't sound disrespectful in any way, but when you look at scriptures, Jesus gives us a hint as to what matters. And be honest, the bar is not set that high. That's the beautiful thing. If you don't believe me, check it out. Look with me at Matthew 10, 42. He says this, Whoever gives one of the little ones of these even a cup of cold water because he is my disciple, truly I say to you, he will by no means lose his reward. Did you catch that? So that little cute boy that just came up and brought me this water won't lose his reward. This means something. I'll give you another hint. Jesus probably isn't only limiting this to a cup of water. That's not water. Um, we'll put that aside here. Let me, here you go. I'm going to hand this over to you. You can take this for a second. I'm going to keep this cup. So what are you doing to bless your neighbors? What are you doing during this time? Did you get this? Even a simple cup of water counts. Here's what Jesus is saying to me. He's saying, do something. Just get beyond yourself. <laughs> for the love of donuts, could you, for one moment, take your eyes off of your own problems? your own issues, your own myopic universe, and look to meet the need for somebody else. 
It is so powerful. It is so simple. Remember, little things count. If a cup of cold water was mentioned specifically by the Lord, then that means when you see that guy coming through the door and he's struggling, his arms are full of groceries, or maybe he's in a wheelchair or something, and you hold the door open, hey, come on in, God bless you. Y'all, that counts. You smiled at that grumpy neighbor with the yippy dog that you can't stand. And you managed to get out of, God bless you. That counts. You looked at your spouse who's wearing that quarantine sweatpants suit for seven days in a row, and you managed to eke out a sincere compliment. It counts. It counts. It's a cup of cold water. In Jesus' name, every little tiny kindness can have an eternal impact because you don't know where those people are. Just yesterday, we had somebody reach out and want to bless somebody, brought an envelope of cash and gave it to somebody that we knew was hurting and struggling. Y'all, the tears that flowed, it counts. Every little kindness, it could be the thing that saves them from making a horrible decision later that day. Every little compliment even has an eternal impact. Speaking of compliments, I got to share this with you. This is too good. You're going to remember this for a long time. You're gonna, where is he going with this? I promise. I heard a joke this week that is so bad, it's good, all right? And you're going you're gonna to groan when you hear this, but I promise you, you're never going to forget this point, okay? There was a business traveler. It was during the pandemic. He was all dressed up in his fancy clothes, and he gets on the plane to fly to L.A. for a conference, but there's nobody on the plane. He has the entire jet to himself. He's like, man, this is great. So the flight attendant says, take any seat you want. So he goes and he sits down, picks this nice comfy leather seat in the first class, he reclines it all the way back and orders a little beverage. And he starts to tune out the world when out of the blue, he hears this beautiful calm voice say, man, that is a nice tie. And he sits up and he's looking around thinking, what? I thought I was the only one on this plane. Pandemic's getting to me. I'm just, I'm, I'm hearing things. So he closes his eyes. He leans back again. Sure enough, louder. He says, man, that is a beautiful shirt. What a great coat you're wearing. Now the man sits up, and he's like, all right, I know I'm hearing voices. So he called the flight attendant over. The flight attendant comes over and says, listen, am I losing my mind? Because I thought I was the only one on this plane, other than the, you and the co-pilot. And, I mean, am, am I missing something? Because I keep hearing voices, but there's nobody here but me. And she smiles. She says, oh, yeah, it's the, it's the ginger ale you're drinking. He said, excuse me, the what? She said, yeah, it's the ginger ale. It's complimentary. <laughs> right? Right? I told you, it was so bad. It's, it's true. You will never forget this point, y'all. Even little compliments matter. And I want you to remember that because so many times, be honest, we think good things, but we fail to tell the people. What good does it do my wife on Mother's Day to say, man, she looks beautiful today, if I never tell her, but I think it. Even a little compliment can be a big deal. But here's the problem. I mean, let's just be frank. You can take your masks off, even if you're at home. Well, maybe you should keep your mask on, but you could take your mask off symbolically and be real and honest here because the truth is we are woefully self-focused. We are inherently self-centered. We look to our own needs first. So I want to break it down today, and, and I want to kind of leave you with some, some different levels of selflessness. And I want you to do an evaluation, okay? It's just you, just you and the Lord. You don't have to say anything out loud. I want to break it down into different levels of kindness, okay? The first one... I kind of liken it to kindergarten. So we have the, the kindergarten level of kindness. This is the basic kindness that I hope everybody has. All right, so if you need a, a, a modern day illustration, let's say there's a packed crowd and there's a fire over in the corner and somebody pulls the fire alarm and everybody stands up and rushes. Having the kindergarten level of kindness means you don't go grab all the small children and throw them out of the way or step on walk out to get out first. You actually let them go first, okay? Hopefully every one of us has at least graduated kindergarten kindness. Although, some days at Walmart, it does make me wonder if we have. Then there's the next level, the elementary school level. And sadly, I think a lot of people are stuck here. I think this is the level that a lot of our society is stuck at. This is the kind of selflessness where, yeah, you can let other people go before you. You might even share with others. When people are with you, you might even make the effort to put them first. But just like a grade school typical kid would, when they're out of sight, they're out of mind. And frankly, you never give them another thought. Maybe you're stuck at that level. Maybe that's you and you think, you know what, that's kind of that's kind of nailing me. That's kind of where I'm at if I'm being honest. We can graduate up to the high school level. The high school level of selflessness is when people aren't with you, but you still think about them. You still pray for them. You still consider how you can be a blessing to them. 
And that's pretty good. And a lot of you might make it to that level. And if so, you need an attaboy for that. But there's another level. It's for those of us who are Christ followers. It's the college level. So if you like the collegiate level, I want you to think of this level of kindness. This is where not only you think about other people, you think about them whether they're there or they're not, but you take the next step and you do something. You literally are sacrificial. Your kindness comes with being willing to sacrifice your own well-being for somebody else. See where we're going now? Your, your kindness shows where you are willing to sacrifice your own comfort. You're willing to sacrifice your own treasure, your own stuff to help them. All right, so these are the people that you look around and you think, man, they are selfless. Look at them. These are the people who willingly put their life on hold, go tag up with volunteer missionaries and doctors and nurses, and go set up a tent hospital in the middle of Central Park, only to be insulted and ridiculed and mocked and told to leave. And that's next level kindness and selflessness, getting nothing out of it for themselves. These are the kind of people that turn their homes into orphanages because they see hurting kids that need a safe place to live and they cannot shut their doors. It's next level, college kindness. And it reminds me of Christ. These are the kind of people that leave anonymous envelopes with just enough cash that it happens to be exactly what your rent needed to be for that struggling family. And it pays it for the month. These are the kind of people who selflessly leave all the comforts of America and move to Yemen <laughs> to advance the gospel, or Ghana, or Appalachia, or maybe just the other side of town across the tracks, all for the desire to advance the kingdom. And you got somebody like Jesus, who gives the ultimate example, who sacrifices his life for us, even while we were enemies of God. So if reaching out this morning begins with those four words, right? I notice, and you matter. If it begins with that, how do we take it to this next level? How do we go and graduate beyond kindergarten kindness? Hear me. I'm not trying to give you some set formula. I do want to give you a method. I want to share with you something that you need to know is dangerous. Because if you do this, it can radically change what happens with your day going forward. And it can radically change that day when you stand before the Lord on that last day and you give account. And you will be so glad that you took a challenge in 2020 for a simple two-part prayer that I hope you will consider praying. This is so, so profound. It's so short. It's beautifully powerful. And hear me, this is not just a pray once and move on thing. I'm not talking about like a prayer of Jabez or God bless me. Anything. I'm talking about a new spiritual discipline that literally takes you 30 seconds, but it changes your entire focus. And it has the ability to be a, a part of your regular prayer life. I want you to pray this every time you see somebody in pain. I want you to pray this every time you see somebody who has a need, okay? I want you to think about it. God, how can I be the hands and feet of Christ here? I want you to pray it every time you notice someone and you want to let them know they matter, okay? And I can almost guarantee you, if you pray and you honestly mean every Every time you say this for somebody, your life will change. So I have a piqued your interest. You got your pen ready? Got your digital notepad ready? Here it is. This is a beautiful, simple two-part prayer. The first part is this. I want you to pray, Lord, what do they need? Write it down. Lord, what do they need? See, this takes our eyes off ourselves. This puts it right on the person. And then the second part I want you to pray right after that, what should I do? What should I do, Lord? How can I get beyond myself? How can I do what Jesus talked about? What can, is there a cup of water? What can I do? Do you see how this can change everything? How it changes your perspective? Let's break it down into the real world. Okay, I want to show you some hypotheticals. Let's say you have a friend who recently lost a loved one. What do you do? Well, if you're like most people, you reach out to them and say, I am so sorry. Is there anything I can do? And if they're like most people, they respond, not really. I mean, you can pray for me. So you do, and not much more happens beyond that. And you move on. Now imagine if you found out about that person's loss, and before you said anything, you stop and you pray, Lord, what do they need? Not what do I want to do for them. Not what would I need in this situation. Lord, what is it that they need? And the divine whisper races through your mind and says, they need to know right now that they are not alone. 
because they're feeling alone more than ever. They need to know that they are not alone. And then you pray the second part, okay? What should I do? And not long after that prayer, you have the idea, meet their need, take them to lunch, show them they're not alone. So when you call, instead of asking the usual impossible to answer question, hey, how can I help? You call and be proactive with your cup of water and you say, hey, my heart goes out to you. I remember your favorite restaurant is Skipper's. Can I come get you and take you to lunch and just spend some time with you and buy you a meal and just let you know that you matter and you're not alone? And if it's pandemic time, you say, I'll go get it or I'll take you with you. I'll even take my minivan. You could sit in the far back corner with your mask on. I'll be in the driver's seat. We'll get it and we'll eat it through our masks together. We'll sit in the parking lot. But at least they know they have been seen and they matter. And here you are, man, you are up in the stratosphere of selfless serving. That prayer, that little change may seem so small, but it is so big to that person who's grieving. Think how many lives will be different, how the community would be, how the church would be different if we would make this a regular discipline every day to pray for somebody else. When we see this prayer and we make it as much a part of our day as waking up and brushing our teeth, we say, God, today, use me to be the hands and feet of Christ. Think about this. And I'm not expecting us to do this for everyone. We can't. But every one of us can do it for someone. We can make a difference in somebody's life. And every day we should do this because it works on so many levels. Let's say you're in the line at DMV with those blessed people, bless their hearts. And you see a man and they're mean and they're cranky and they are standing in line and you're desperately awkwardly trying to talk to people through a mask and socially awkward distance and all this stuff. And you're looking in line and it's not moving and you see that guy up there working the counter is clearly miserable. I mean, it's obvious. So you stop and you say, God, what do they need? And immediately, you stop focusing on you and your problem. And you think about them. How can I be light to them? God, what do they need? I think they could use a little compassion today. Okay, what should I do? I think you could tell them that you notice them and you appreciate how hard they work and that they have a thankless job and you're grateful. Y'all, that could change their day. This prayer works instantly. Let's say you're driving and you see a guy on the corner and he's homeless. And you're stopped at a light. You've got that awkward time where you can, but maybe you could pull over and you say, God, what does he need? And this time, the word dignity comes to mind. Hey, God, how do I give this man dignity? I've got 10 minutes before I've got to be at my next appointment. And you feel that divine whisper say, just look him in the eye. Maybe offer to shake his hand and say, I love you. I'm praying for you. Can I buy you a quick combo meal at that restaurant right there? Because that restaurant's hurting too. Think about that. It counts. It's a cup of cold water. And if this counts, imagine what next level kindness does for the kingdom and the glory we reflect up. And it's not just for little random things like this. This could be for something you've been going on and on with and wrestling with. You might pray this every day. God, my daughter is struggling right now. The stuff she's going through what does she need? And after praying about this for time and time, maybe you finally hear that whisper. She needs to know that you are there for her no matter what. Okay? God, what do you want me to do? And the idea whispers to your heart. I want you to find one way to reach out to her every single day. One tangible way. One small way, one big way. I want you to pray about it, and I want you to be intentional. Find one way to show her kindness and love every day, and I want you to keep praying because it counts. This can happen with that obnoxious, mean-spirited teenager at, at your school or maybe the one at work that nobody likes. I mean, let's be honest. There's no other word. He, he's, just, he's just a jerk. <laughs> and you pray, God, what does that jerk need? <laughs> what, what, what does it need? And then God says, that person needs a hug. And you might pray, well, God, I'm praying that you will raise up some fine soul to go give that jerk a hug. What if it's us that God's calling to give that jerk a hug, to look him in the eye and show him unfettered love? Not because of how he's treated you, not because he's done anything to deserve it, but because he is precious and made in the image of God. 
Now, I want to give you a warning. Now, I didn't start with this on purpose because I didn't want you to tune this out. But I'm actually very serious about this because Scripture is. James 4.17 says this is a radical and effective prayer. Okay, so it comes with a warning. He says this. If anyone then knows the good they ought to do and doesn't do it, for them, it's sin. You see that? The danger with praying this prayer, church, I'm going to bring this home, is that as things come to mind from the Holy Spirit, we need to follow through. Can I be honest with us? Yeah? John, nod with me. Okay? All right, lean in a little bit. Closer. Closer. This right here is where we drop the ball the most. I know us. I'm, I'm just like you. We have great intentions, but so many times we fail to follow through. So many times we know the good we should do, and we don't do it. And we're robbing the Father of glory, of his radiant church, who should be just a mirror pointed up. We're magnifying and radiating holy light back up to glory, and we don't. Because we think the good things, we think the nice stuff we should do, but for some reason, we don't get it over the finish line. We don't follow through. James is warning us about that. So, for example, what if it went like this? God, there's that couple that's been on my mind. I know they're struggling. What is it that that couple that you put on my heart, again, what do they need this morning? And you hear him whisper, they need a car for their daughter. And you pray, okay, God, what do you want me to do? <laughs> Give them one. <laughs> Wait, what? Give them one. Oh, yeah, so you prayed the prayer, didn't you? <laughs> now you're in the big leagues of faith. And it's exciting. Because God is going to use an open and yielded vessel. And you just opened that door. What do you do? See, all of a sudden, man, you're playing in the big league of faith. That's college-level kindness. So here's your challenge, okay? I want all of us to think about that. Would you please consider joining me in doing that this week? Would you start every day by finding one person every day where your actions say, I notice you and you matter. I notice. And then I want you to pray this simple prayer once a day for just one person. Now, you may pray this prayer, Lord, what do they need? What should I do? You may pray this prayer for the same person over and over. That is fine. And God may give you an answer right away, or he may not. He may choose to let you continue to live a spirit-led life, and, and he'll answer a little bit later. But at least you are getting your eyes off yourself, and you are showing, hey, Lord, I am yielded. How can you use me? He may, and now listen, I'm not saying he's going to make everyone buy him a car either, by the way. But I'm certain sooner or later, God is going to bring some things to your mind. And here's the cool part part I haven't shared with you. Not only is this a win-win because on that last day you will be so glad you did things to advance the kingdom, but you get blessed today. When you step out of your comfort zone and you get your eyes off of self, you say, I see you, I notice you, you matter. Lord, what do you want me to do about this person? How can I meet this need? You will be so slam full of amazing ministry stories now. Your whole life will be mountaintop and mountaintop and mountaintop, different events that you see where God has used you. He's included you. Yeah, he scared you. And he's come through for you time and time again. What an adventure we are all about to live if you take this challenge. If we begin praying about everything, how do we live with eternity in mind? I want to challenge you to do that, okay? Try this every day for this next week and let me hear your stories. See if God uses this to change anything. Okay, please hear me. Don't let this be just another nice sermon. Thank you, Pastor Matt. That was nice. Take the challenge and let's all get beyond ourselves because even small things done in the name of the Lord has an eternal impact. Will you take the challenge? Let me pray for you. Right where you are, would you bow with me? Just close your eyes. Tune out these distractions as we seek the Lord and how we can live with eternity in mind. Father, I thank you for the ultimate kindness you show us day in and day out. God, thank you for salvation. It's your kindness that brings us to salvation. Lord, I pray that you will help us this week to notice others because they matter to you. Lord, I pray you will help us, remind us to seek your will, to seek your plans, 
for them. Not what we want, but what need can we meet for them? Would you show us? Please show us, Lord, how we can make a difference and how we can touch one life every day this week. At the end of it all, Lord, we so want to hear you say, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your master. God, thank you for this time. Thank you for the chance to worship you, to hear your word. Thank you for a chance to be in your presence. You're so good to us. We love you. We pray in your powerful name. Amen. And amen. It's been great to be with you guys. I love you. I miss you. And I hope I'll see you this Wednesday live online for another Bible study. God bless you guys. Have an awesome week.